Your Lord has 99 health. If you just don't die, you're you're already at an advantage. You already have the highest health of any worm, I think. Oh, oh my, my god! god. That's <laughs> stupid. Oh my god! That is, that is ridiculously stupid. <laughs> that is ridiculously <laughs> stupid. Worms. Most people I know have played it. I myself have many fond memories of blowing up my friends and family playing these games. I recently rediscovered this series in the form of Worms 3 on mobile, mainly because I've been spending a lot of time booking it around the country on trains with nothing much to do on the journeys. And for the most part, Worms is still just as good as I remember, even on mobile. It does have its flaws though. I don't know if it's just been a while since I've played against a Worms AI and they've always been this dumb, or if this game's just a one-off, but I mean, look at this clip. So this Worms strategy was to throw a grenade at himself converting him into a projectile, which shot across the map, and opened it to one of my worms. He then proceeded to explode upon death, and do 15 damage to me. Now I know that it must be quite a challenge to create an AI that isn't incompetent in such a diverse environment, but after playing against these plebs for far too long, I was left wanting to at least try. So here I am, making my third worms clone. Yeah, third. Apparently I couldn't get it right the first two times. They were both flawed in their own ways, which I want to talk about in a bit. They were more sort of tests than full-on games, but this time, I want to go all out and do a proper job. I mean, my university grade kind of depends on it. Right then, let's uh, get to it. The first step was choosing what to make it in. I need to be able to test collisions between the pixels of an image and mostly circles and points travelling within the surface. This is because the terrain in Worms tends to just be an image that progressively gets more blown up by the end of the game and players need to be able to walk on and shoot this dynamic terrain. I ended up going with C++ and STL2, as I know how to use these pretty well now. I also feel like I wouldn't get much benefit from using a game engine, as I'm going to have to write the physics system from scratch anyway. So C++ and STL2 it is. I think it's a good idea to run over the flaws of my previous clones, so I can attempt to make the new one less, well, bad. You just shot what? through the floor! <laughs> Most of the issues in my first clone came down to the collision detection being just terrible. Well, that and my inability to draw. Just look at these dudes. The main reason my collision detection sucked was that I was only testing for collisions once per frame for a discrete time interval. Let me explain. Every frame, a moving character's position would be updated based on their velocity and the time passed since the last frame and this new position would be tested to see if a few points relative to the player had passed into the ground. If so, then the player would need to be ejected from the ground using the offset of the test position. Some of you may have already guessed a few potential issues with this method. For one, it's highly susceptible to passing through terrain if either the FPS of the game is low, or the speed of the object is high. Another issue is that we aren't checking enough points relative to the object to have accurate collisions even in optimal conditions. If we are checking these three points, and our character is on this trajectory, we would assume that they would bump their head. But they would actually pass right through the terrain using this method. Also, I'm pretty sure that the version of this project that is on my public GitHub doesn't even boot. So let's hope that our new clone can at least do that. My second clone had far better physics than the first, but that's because I was no longer using the pixels of the image for collision. I was effectively using a dynamic collision mesh, updated using the marching squares algorithm. It worked like this. The terrain data existed not as pixels, but as scalar field data. The more white an area is here, the more inland it is. When the terrain needed to be updated, the marching squares algorithm would be used on parts of this scalar field to create lines that covered the perimeter of the land. These lines could then be used to do far more accurate collisions, and do other essential things like creating a polygon that could be textured to show the terrain on screen. This method was great, but it did have one somewhat major downside. Terrain lacked the fidelity that you can achieve with just an image. The edges of the terrain would always be smooth, creating what I thought was very unnatural terrain destruction. This could have been fixed by increasing the resolution of both the scalar field data and the marching square cells, but it still would have required me to do far more work to do simple things like add images as part of the terrain, or put nice decals on the surface of the terrain after explosions, etc. Given these flaws, I decided that the new clone should have image-based terrain, therefore I'll need some better object-to-surface collisions. 
So here's how I plan to solve the janky collisions I had in the first clone. Let's take the same scenario that we had earlier, but instead of just sampling the object's position at a discrete time per frame, let's check all pixels the object will sweep through over the course of the frame. To simplify this, I'll just show the process for a point object, but the logic can be extended to almost any shape. This should solve our clipping issues that we saw earlier. So at the collision step, we can know this point's start position and where it would like to be at the end of the frame, but sometimes you can't give soulless point objects what they want. We have to check if any pixels along this line are collidable. If there are any, then we can have a collision and mess up that lovely arc that the object was travelling on, and do some exploding or bouncing or whatever we want to do based on the object. Simple so far, but how do we actually check every pixel along this line without using loads of processing power? So what I'm going to do here is give you this Wikipedia link to Bresenham's line algorithm and say go, shoo, read it in full, because no doubt it's a better implementation than what you're about to see. I took one look at the mathsy part, not realising that there's some lovely code like two centimetres down, and thought, nope, let me do this my way. And I scurried away on all fours, back to my cave, and came back an hour later with this. Ugh, it's hideous! It works by calculating the gradient of the line, and the magnitude of this gradient, along with the directions it needs to travel in x and y to get to the end point. Then this loop is used to increment the x, and this loop is used to increment y, which can increase as many steps as is necessary based on the gradient. For example, if the gradient was 2, then for every x iteration we would increment our y value by the step 2 times. These loops will continue to run either until we reach the end pixel in the line, or we find a solid pixel, upon which we will return information about the collision. This will be done by altering a variable passed in by reference. And that's it. There's actually a pretty significant mistake in here that I didn't find until later in development. See if you can guess what it is, and I'll show you what it caused in a bit. No doubt some of you guys will find issues other than the one I'm on about here. So hopefully that makes sense for a point. But how do we deal with objects with a bit of meat on them? Let's look at a circle. So instead of tracing just one line from a start to an end position, we can trace multiple lines, offset from the object's start and end position, and then see if any of our line traces hit solid terrain. If so, then we have a collision. And we can work out the earliest collision position by simply taking the collision that was closest to its own starting position. With a circle radius of around 20 pixels and 11 offsets, I found that you can get near-perfect results. And all you have to do for larger objects is simply up the number of offsets. If you want true pixel-perfect collisions, you could use the same logic used to draw circles to create your offset positions. This would make it impossible for any terrain to slip under the radar. Potential optimizations for this approach are as follows. You could only trace lines from the offsets that are less than 90 degrees, or any other angle that you see fit, from the direction of movement. This will cut down on duplicate pixel checks made by lines drawn from the back of the object. It's worth noting that this optimization may mess up objects with non-standard shapes, like this example. Another speedup could be to check every offset line in parallel as opposed to in sequence, and just take the first collision you find, meaning you check pixel 1 of every line, then pixel 2, then pixel 3, etc. Stopping when a collision occurs. This would cut down on checking lots of pixels even though your closest point has already been found. You might think that even with these optimizations, this would still be a lot of computation for a single object, but when you consider that on average, objects aren't moving at Mach 1, and will likely only travel a few pixels each frame, it becomes less of an issue. I've tested this in a sluggish debug build, and it can support 3000 of these dynamic colliders with next to no lag, which is far more than I intend to have at any one time for this project. I've skimmed over quite a large portion of this collision system so far, mainly what happens when we actually hit something. I said we should make the object bounce or explode or whatever, but I haven't actually said how we can do that. Typically, most collision systems will allow you to access what's called a collision normal, which is effectively the direction in which impulses should be applied to the objects after the collision. It also tends to be the direction that objects should move to eject themselves from the surface. But we're not working with vector data. We don't know the surface normal of a pixel, we just know if it's solid or not. So what options do we have? One solution is to use the inverse offset direction as our normal. So depending on which offset trace found the collision, we can use that offset to get our collision normal. This works fine if we have a large number of offsets, but if we only had, say, 8, 
then we would only have 8 possible collision normals, which greatly reduces the fidelity of our bounces. Alternatively, we could compute normal vectors for each solid pixel in the terrain and store them in a 2D array. This would allow us to simply index that array at the position of the collision and use that as the collision normal. But how do we work out these pixel normals? The method I used is as follows. For each pixel you wish to update the normal for, you check the surrounding pixels at a degree of fidelity of your choosing, and for every solid pixel, you add its offset from the main pixel to a cumulative total. Once all nearby pixels are checked, you can simply normalise this offset, negate it, and then you have a normal. This method can however get very expensive very quickly if you're careless with the fidelity level of each normal. Updating a 100 by 100 square of solid terrain, which isn't actually that big, with a normal fidelity of 5, would actually end up being 800,000 vector addition operations and 10,000 normalise operations, which as you can imagine, doesn't come cheap. This scenario is however the worst case. It's also only necessary to update solid pixels that are adjacent to non-solid ones, so like the border around terrain because we've got pixel-perfect collisions, so we're never going to sample the inside. So if we check for that, we can cull the large majority of these updates. It might be worth checking if a pixel's neighbours have changed since its last update, because if they haven't, then there's no reason it should update. This could be done with some kind of pixel-changed mask that is updated when explosions and whatever happen to the terrain. This method does, however, create normals that almost perfectly represent the terrain surface. Keyword there, almost. Consider the following terrain, a single pillar of width 1. The average offset of the pixel right here in the middle will equal 0, which cannot be normalised. And it makes perfect sense that a normal for this pixel cannot be computed. Which direction would you put it? If it was left, then a collision from the right would most likely break, and vice versa. So what do we do? My solution to this issue was to set the normals below a defined level of certainty to 0, and then when 0 normals are sampled, just use the offset normal instead. I also used the offset normal to push the object out of the ground, as I found that the offset normal works far better for this task. <laughs> so we now have consistent good normals for every scenario. But what do we actually want to do with this info? How can we make our object bounce? Well the base idea is actually quite simple. We can take our object's velocity and reflect it in the plane of our normal, and then reduce the magnitude of the velocity by some calculated amount based on the circumstances. I tend to use the GLSL reflect function for this. It takes an incident vector and a surface normal and returns the reflected vector. We can simply pass it our object's current velocity and our shiny new collision normal to get the updated velocity for our object to use. I also added another 0 to 1 parameter called flatten which dictates how much our incident vector will be flattened in the direction of the normal after reflection. This maintains the original magnitude of the incident vector, it simply redirects it to a more flat angle helping objects to roll instead of bouncing. This is more expensive as it requires a normalised call, but I like the result, so it stays. I also added some friction based on the angle of impact, and with just this alone, our objects can move around the level fairly convincingly, as you can see here in this early test footage. As happy as I was with the collisions at this stage, I knew that they needed to rotate on impact as well to seal the deal. The rotation I ended up with is driven by the following three factors. The speed of the object, the distance from the collision contact point to the object's centre, so in the case of a circle, just the radius, and the angle of impact. This means that if either the speed of the object increases, the object's radius shrinks, or the angle of impact increases, the object will spin faster after an impact. This is the code I used to work out the new rotational speed for those curious. It shows how those factors work together to get resultant angular velocity. I found that at this stage of development, I had basically entered Tweak City. I remember I literally spent an entire day just trying to nail down the values to get grenades to have satisfying bouncing and rolling but still actually coming to a stop this century. Well, actually that last thing needed more than just tweaking. To make sure that the grenades settle a bit quicker instead of bouncing around for ages, I actually added a drag force that increases in magnitude as an object slows to a stop. And not even this was the end of it. In specific scenarios, objects could be jammed between two somewhat vertical surfaces and never actually come to a stop. This is because their velocity would stay at quite a high value, even though their position isn't really changing from frame to frame. The reason for this was that the object was being moved back up through collisions with the wall. If you remember I talked about ejecting the object from the surface using its offset normal, but the velocity isn't being altered that much as it's being reflected in a mostly vertical plane, and the friction will be minimal because of the steep angle of impact, so the velocity just keeps increasing due to gravity. I ended up fixing this by adding an invisible entity for each object that always follows its own object. For frames where the object's centre is inside the follower's radius, a freeze value increases, and any frame that they aren't intersecting, the freeze value decreases, 
But if this freeze value exceeds some defined threshold, then it will put the object into a frozen state which game logic can pick up on. For example, the holy hand grenade triggers an explosion countdown and plays a sound when it freezes. With the addition of this, objects in the aforementioned tight situation will briefly keep their speed while being put back to the same spot, but as their position is mostly stationary, the invisible entity will quickly catch up and freeze them. All these new thresholds and arbitrary values joined the rest of the population in Tweak City, which was already quite overcrowded. As you can imagine, I had a field day trying to get them all to behave, but the moderate suffering was worth it because the result was beautiful. Just look at how they bounce and roll. Mesmerising. Words can't express how happy I was with these physics. I frequently looked back at the first clone just to scoff and insult my past self. As you can see here, I actually already added some cool terrain and particle stuff at this point in time. But that's a topic for another video, as we're already sitting at around 20 minutes here. Jesus. <laughs> You may remember earlier that I talked about an issue with the line trace code, and before I tell you what it was, this is what it caused. Every time a collider stopped bouncing on the surface, it would quickly jitter before my freeze code kicked in. And I spent ages fiddling with my collision response code before I figured out it was to do with my collision detection. I felt like a right nonce, but was relieved that I had found it out nonetheless. Here was the simple issue. I was never checking the last pixel in any line trace that I did. This meant that I was frequently missing collisions that I should have been accounting for at the end of every line trace, allowing for objects to clip into the surfaces, then jump out when the penultimate pixel or any other one detected a solid surface. Oh, the joys of trying to find that out. And it was so simple. We are the rats. At some point down the line, I converted the physics to use their own fixed time step, which had some pretty nifty effects. One cool thing that came from having pixel-perfect collisions and a fixed time step was the fact that as far as I could tell, the physics acted in a deterministic manner, meaning that if two identical objects were put in the same position and given the same velocity, they would both share the exact same bounces and explode position, etc. Which, considering I was only using single precision floats for the positions and velocities, I found quite surprising. I assumed that the physics would be chaotic, and when I say chaotic, I mean that two instances with identical starting conditions will have vastly different end conditions. This is usually because of unavoidable small errors in measurements, rounding errors in numerical computation, or any data that could change instance to instance, like my old varying time step for instance. Famous examples of chaotic behaviour are the double pendulum and most gravity simulations. Anyways, the point is that I'm pretty sure it's consistent for quite a long time. This consistency would be a real help if I wanted to implement some kind of replay system as I would just be able to store a single snapshot of the players and terrain at the start of the turn, and then every action that the players made over the course of the turn could be stored as they occur. Then to view the replay, you just load the state and play the actions at the same time as the player did, and it should play out the same as it did originally, which would be far more efficient. I imagine it would also make networking a huge amount easier. Definitely something to look into down the line. Anyways, hopefully you found that little dive into worms like game physics interesting. I'd also like to make a video about terrain generation and destruction, as there are some cool bits to talk about in there too, which should be out fairly soon. Although given my track record of saying I'll make videos and then not, I wouldn't hold your breath. Cough. Cough. For those curious if I plan to make any more videos on the Terraria clone, the answer is yes, but I'm not sure when exactly, as I'm spending most of my free time doing uni work at the moment, which this worms game technically is. I also just wanted to thank everyone who subscribed or showed their support in whatever way that they did. We're now just over 600 strong, and our Discord is growing slowly in numbers as well. Rumour has it, a conversation happened there the other day. Not sure if that's true. You have to find out yourself. You can hop in using the link in the description if you fancy a chat with me or any of the other like-minded folk we have hanging around. Anyway, that's all from me, so I'll see you in the next one.